Well, at the risk of being predictable, here goes. Um, a doctor, a lawyer, uh, and a politician walked up to the pearly gates and were confronted by St. Peter. Yes, I'm going to do this. Uh, St. Peter, uh, he, he informed them that in order to get into heaven, they would each have to answer a question of varying difficulty based on how they lived their life on earth. He started with a doctor and he said, here's your question. Uh, you need to name the vessel that was sunk by an iceberg on its maiden voyage. And the doctor said, oh, that's easy. It's the Titanic. And he said, that's correct. Welcome into heaven. He turned to the lawyer and he said, um, you know, he decided the question needed to be a little bit more difficult, even though he had done some good. He was a bit of an ambulance chaser at some point in his career. And so he said, I, I want you to know how many people, uh, I want to know how many people died on that ship. And the lawyer, fortunately for him, uh, Titanic was one of his favorite m movies. He's a Leo fan. So um, he, he said 1,500 people, about 1,500 people. And uh, St. Peter said, that's close enough. Come on in. And then he turned to the politician and he said, now you're going to have to name them all. <laughs> um, there's a, a fascination in our culture with heaven. Um, and whether it's jo jokes or cultural references, um, there's an undeniable fascination with this. And it's not a religion, religious thing. It's a human thing. Um, and it permeates our culture in, in so many different ways. In fact, I just want you to think about our language and all the references to heaven. And I'm not going to name them all, but, but just a few. And you can play along if you want. You, two things that go together really, really well, like peanut butter and jelly or bread and butter or Brad and now Jen. Um, it, we call them match made in heaven. Or, or if somebody experiences something that's like extraordinary or the experience of a lifetime, we say they died and had gone to heaven. And if you did something really, really difficult for somebody and you wanted them to know it, you tell them that you had to move heaven and earth in order to make this happen. And then there's some particularly Southern idioms that, that don't always make sense. Like, I still am confused about for heaven's sake. Like, is this positive or negative? I hear people like appalled by things that are like, well, for heaven's sake. And then there's other people that's like, oh, for heaven's sake, look at them. You know, it's like, is that good or is it bad? I don't know if it's good or bad. And then there's things that stink to high heaven. We know that's bad. And then there's in hog heaven, which is good which hogs stink. And so I'm not sure, like this is all can be a little bit confusing. But, but anyway, we use these references and I don't think it's by accident. In fact, there's such a fascination, you know, um, the, the musicians are sort of the cultural poets of our day. And there's all sorts of perspectives we get from music um, uh, about heaven. In fact, Zeppelin was on a stairway to heaven and ACDC was rolling down a highway to hell. Um, Guns N' Roses actually made a song by Bob Dylan, really famous, called Knock, Knock, Knockin' on Heaven's Door, which could be helpful, by the way. If you get there and you can't get in, maybe three knocks is like the secret code to get into heaven. You know what I'm saying? Somebody really liked that one. So, and then, and then Bruno Mars, I mean, I imagine this, he, he, somebody made him feel like he was locked out of heaven. Like that feels like a, a terrible thought. And here's the question. The question is, where does the fascination come from? What's driving it? Why, why are we so curious? And, and it, the very easy answer is this, that the mortality rate is 100%. Now, hopefully you didn't just figure that out. Tell me there was nobody that just figured that out for the first time. A church wouldn't be a terrible place to figure that out for the first time, but the mortality rate's 100%. And the truth is, is we're certain there's going to be an end to this life. The question is, then what? Like at the end of this life, like what's next? And, and is that good or bad? And should I look forward to it or not? And how do I know what's there? And I know we, we, we think about this because there's a recent study that was done. It was an extensive study. It, it figured out that, that three, um, people on average, they think about death three to four times a month. Like when you think about that, that's, that seems like a lot. That was, that was like surprising to me. And that, you know, it's not necessarily their death, but we contemplate it. In fact, there's even some people that think this is a really good thing. When I was in my 20s, I was introduced to a book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which I think is a fantastic book. And the second habit is begin with the end in mind. Some of you remember this. And Stephen Covey in this amazing book, he, he um, suggests, specifically people that were in my stage of life and early on in, in life and in your 20s and your 30s, you should think about, one of the exercises he gives, you should think about your funeral and what you want said about you then. And then you should back all the way up to now and go, if I'm going to begin with that end in mind, how do I need to live my life in such a way so that when I get there, the things that I want to be said about me will actually be the things that are said about me? 
life experience drive our interest. The loss of a loved one, near-death experiences, which we're actually going to talk about in the coming weeks, difficult circumstances, um, even having children, thinking about a, a time in the future when you're going to be uh, separated from them and wondering if you'd be reunited. Eric Clapton wrote a song about that when he lost a child. He wondered if his child would know his name if he saw him in heaven. So here's the question I want to start with. The question I want us all to think about for a second is, what do you think about when you think about heaven? What comes to mind when you think about heaven? What are the images that come to mind? What are the thoughts that come to mind? And how do those thoughts make you feel? Do they make you feel excited? Do they make you feel worried? Do you have no emotional response to them at all? Hey, here's why, because there's lots of interest about heaven, but there's also lots of misinformation and speculation, even confusion about heaven. Polls show actually amongst Christians that many wonder if heaven's even a real physical place. Like there's a lot of Christians that just, I don't know. And, And others consider what they know about heaven to be uninteresting and unrelatable and less appealing than this world, the world that we live in, which, which, you know, in some ways I can't fault people because of the tangibility of that versus the intangible of a place I've never been and a place I can't visit, I can't get a window into. See, this is what I think. I think the problem isn't that, um, that we don't think about heaven enough. I don't think that's the problem. I don't think the problem is that we don't think about heaven enough. I think the problem is that we don't think enough about heaven. We don't think highly enough about heaven. It's not impressive. It's not inspiring to us. Most of us don't have a good picture of the true realities of heaven. In fact, a lot of us, we were sort of sold a picture of heaven that isn't very alluring. In fact, it's even boring to us. It may appear as boring. I, you know, I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are, but, um, you know, based, based on Zeppelin's uh, uh, song, we, we, we think there's a stairway to heaven, or most people contemplate whether there's a stairway to heaven or not. I don't know if there is or not. But, and then the truth is, is, is we're told in the scriptures that, um, that there's, there's these gates that you enter into. So you, you enter into some pearly gates as you walk into heaven. We've been told it's like in the clouds. You know, I, I don't know what that means. Is it floating? Um, and, and this will be a little controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway, because the worst you can do is email me, I guess. So here's the thing. Um, you know, there's, we're, we're told in heaven there's these streets of gold. And yes, I'm aware that this is in the Bible. But like, I wonder, like, after my whole life being, people telling me like, hey, you need to have good stewardship. Like, are streets of gold really good stewardship? Like, is that, is that a good way to use gold and that wealth? And, and then it starts making me think that, that maybe that might... Um, that might encourage vandalism. And like, there might be a lot of potholes as people are digging out the gold in heaven. I know that's a little bit strange, but that's, I mean, that's some of the things I think about. And then, and then there's the mansions, which I know some people are like fired up about, but I'll just tell you, we, we have four kids and we have a fairly uh, sizable house. And I'll just tell you, like, I, I'm looking forward to the day when I get to downsize. Like some of you are in that season right now. You're like, you lived in a big house and you're like, I don't want a big, I want a smaller house. Like I want less to take care of. I don't want a big yard. I don't want to be, but there's, we're told there's going to be these mansions in heaven. And, um, you know, maybe you can help me out on this. I don't, I don't know if you'll know what this is, but I'm hoping somebody just for the sake of my ego will help me and know what I'm, what I'm drawing here. But, but, you know, I also think I have questions about mansions um, related to the style. Like, is the style of the mansion going to be like mid-century modern or is it old south or, or is this like European mansion or castle type mansion? And I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of different cultures that God has to account for um, when he's thinking about the mansions that he's creating for people. But, you know, the thing that one of the things that comes to my mind when I think about mansions is this, and I'm thinking at some point, somebody's going to bail me out by telling me what this is. Hopefully, you know, yes, the Taj Mahal. Thank you. I was getting a little worried there. I was thinking you guys might be slower than the first service, which, <laughs> I mean, no, no comparisons, but, you know, I am keeping score. So everything's a competition tomorrow. So, so you know, there's, there's these, you know, these, these, these ideas of mansions, and, and it's like, do we really need that? And how many people are going to be living in this house with me? And, and do I have to take care of them? And will I enjoy having them as roommates? And, you know, there's, there's all these things that relates to that. And then 
And then, um, you know, there's a throne. You know, we've, we've been told about the throne that's in heaven. And of course, this is the throne we're told that the lamb sits on, which is kind of a strange thought, but we know it's a reference to Jesus. And that Jesus is gonna have this throne in heaven. And um, don't ask me why it's the size of the Taj Mahal. I don't really know that answer to that, but it's just how the drawing came out. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's that. And, and um, I, you know, there, we're, we're told that people are gonna be gathered around this throne. And, and they're not just gonna be gathered around the throne, they're gonna be worshiping, which this is a whole nother thing that we have to, we have to deal with. And I don't know how much we're gonna get into this, this series, but I'm just gonna mention it now, you know. There, there's lots of different kinds of singing and worship music going on. And, you know, here we have a very particular style that we like. And I just wonder, like, what style is this worship going to be? And some of you are thinking, if, if heaven's a never-ending worship uh, service, like, I'm out. That sounds like hell, like, more than it sounds like heaven. And especially when you add to the fact that, that there's going to be people everywhere, like multitudes of people. There's going to be people all around you, which sounds like Disney without the rides. And it's like... What in the world are we, are we what is our picture? And, and congratulations, by the way. This is your picture of heaven. This is heaven brought to you by our culture. And no wonder, no wonder we like don't have like this real desire to like go to this place. Because it's like, I mean, I, I, like is this Beverly Hills in the sky? Or I don't, I don't know. And, 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 and I, think, I think this is the problem. Like, some of us, we, we are encouraged. We hear things like, well, you're going to get to be with your family forever. And then others of us are thinking, I have to be with my family forever? <laughs> All jokes aside, like most of us have a more compelling and clearer picture of our next vacation or of retirement than we do of heaven. Of where, if you're a Christian, you believe you're going to spend eternity like you, you have a clearer picture of where you're going to spend a week, a month and a half from now, or where you're going to spend, uh, you know, the, the last 20 years of your life, um, you know, however far away that is for you. And, and the truth is, is, is um, as a result of that, you know, we look more forward to those things and we're better prepared for those things than we are an eternity in heaven. So today, here's what I want to do. Today is going to be sort of a, I'm going to give you a big framework. In fact, at the end of today, you're going to be stuck because after today, you're going to have a lot more questions, but I'm going to give you a framework for how the Bible talks about heaven. And, and it's just a bigger over, overarching framework. We're going to begin with three conversations, excuse me, that reveal the way Jesus viewed the realities of heaven. After all, he's the only one or the only, at least the only sane one um, that, that claimed to be from there. And, and here's how Jesus talked about heaven. The first conversation was with two criminals. You remember this one uh, from on the cross. And he said, uh, and, and, and Luke tells us that one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed and said, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal on the other side, he protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? He goes on, we, we deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he turned, he looked at Jesus, and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then look at this. Jesus says, Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. The first reality that Jesus talked about is a place that people who believe in him go after they die. This is probably the most common uh, uh, idea of heaven. It's just the first reality, but uh, for the repentant criminal, this is what's remarkable to me. Jesus, with confidence, he assures this guy that paradise, this heaven and this paradise is as close as this afternoon for him. The second conversation Jesus has is with uh, his disciples. He's getting ready to leave the earth. And of course, they're, they're sort of troubled by this, terrified by this. And, and so he says this to them. He says, um, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and all, trust in me also. There is enough, or excuse me, there's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will be 
You will always be with me where I am. This is the second reality of heaven. And I need you to, I'm gonna stretch you just a little bit. Jesus is not talking about the same place as the place you go when you die. Um, he's talking about where Jesus followers will spend eternity. He's talking about coming back and getting people and taking them to a place that is still being prepared. This is a second reality. This is a future heaven. It's unique from the place where you go when you die. And then there's a third, a third conversation where Jesus, it, it reveals a, a different reality of heaven that Jesus talked about. And this was a conversation about prayer. They were wondering, how should we pray? And Jesus tells them, he talks about the importance of prayer. prayer and then he says this, this then is how you should pray. You should pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This third reality is, is more about a way we can experience or participate in heaven here and now. It's less about a place that you go to, and it's more about impacting this place with the values of the kingdom of heaven, experiencing heaven in this life, not in the afterlife. So these are th three distinct realities of heaven. Jesus talked about heaven in, in three distinct realities. And they're basically that you, you'll experience, you can experience, heaven is now in another place. So that's the present heaven. That's where you go when you die. It's here at another time, which is, is uh, the place we'll spend eternity. And then heaven is also here and now in another way. We can experience it here and now in another way. Now, one of the things that's important is Jesus was speaking in the context of a Hebrew's understanding about time. So one of the things that we approach the scriptures that oftentimes gets missed is that, that um, Jesus is speaking to, and, and even the, the Old Testament and New Testament writers, they're speaking to a, and writing to a very distinctly Jewish culture. There's a few exceptions to that, but the Old Testament prophets and Jesus and the New Testament writers all spoke about time in the same way. And they divided time into two things. And in fact, in Matthew uh, chapter 12, now, Jesus is having a debate with the Pharisees and he basically tells them that, that their actions will have consequences and they won't be able to escape those consequences in this age or in the age to come. He, he d divides time into two pieces and he says, you won't be able to, to escape the consequences in this age or in the age to come. Now we think about life and time in terms of this life and the afterlife. They thought bigger than that in a bigger context than that. And, and they thought in terms of two ages. There was this age and then the age to come. And in this age, there was, there was a present heaven and a present earth. And the present heaven was separate from earth. The present heaven is the, is the heaven that's now. It's where you go when you die. It, it's, it's now in another place. And the present earth is obviously where we are here. And then they also thought about the age to come. And Jesus described the age to come, and you're going to see in coming weeks, as a new heaven and a new earth. Now, some of you are wondering why, why I said that, that, that heaven uh, is here at another time. See, the heaven that's going to be here at another time, and we're going to talk about this in two weeks, the Scriptures actually talks about that place that's being prepared. It's actually going to descend out of the sky. And we're going to experience a new heaven and new earth as these two things converge. There will be in this age a change from this age to the age to come, and the heavens and the earth will converge. Now, there's a whole bunch of things. They're separated here, then they become united here, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that I know some of you are aware of that happens right in here. And there are a lot of things that are fun to talk about and people debate and people want to hear about. And there are things like the rapture and the millennium and the final judgment and, and all sorts of things like that, which I will say, this is a series on heaven. So I'm not going to get into that. I, I hate to disappoint you, but that could be a different series uh, on a different day for a different preacher, maybe one that rhymes with Randy Manley. But, but like somebody else, somebody else needs to preach on that. But here's what I want you to know. In terms of a big framework, next week, we're going to dive into this age, and we're going to talk about the present heaven. I'm going to answer the question, what happens when you die? 
from a biblical perspective. And then we're also gonna talk about this thing that Jesus said, how you can experience to some degree heaven. We can get a taste of heaven on earth. And how does our view of heaven impact how we live on earth? And specifically, how should it impact that? And in what ways could it impact that? And then in two weeks, I'm gonna unpack, it's gonna be really fun. We're gonna dig into this, this very um, uh, uh, interesting passage. I'll just put it that way, in Revelation And I'm going to do my best to try and, at a high level, give you uh, what I think it's talking about and the specifics of what the eternal heaven will be like. But I believe there's something else that's going on here. And for today, I I want to set this aside because we're going to cover all this over the next two weeks. But I want you to think about this for a second. Um, In this, this verse right here, in this age or in the age to come, Jesus uses a very specific Greek word. And it's this Greek word right here. It's pronounced ion. And Ion is an interesting uh, word that's used for time. Um, It's not necessarily a specific time. It's more of a period of time, not a precise time. It's more, actually, it's more of an indeterminate period of time or like an era, like when you would say, in my childhood. It's sort of like that. But it's not the most common word that he would use in the context that he used it in. There, there's at least two other Greek words. One, chronos. If, if you know any Greek, chronos is a word for time. And then another one is kairos. Kairos is more of a season of time. So it's like a longer period of time, which these were way more common in their culture. And, and it was a word that they would have expected. But I suspect, and I wasn't there, but I suspect maybe Jesus' reason for using this word, and, and even beyond that, what I know people would have heard when he used this word that was sort of a little bit out of context, was that this was also the proper name of a Roman deity, a Roman deity from the Hellenistic period, which if you know anything about the Hellenistic period, is about the 300 years leading up to Christ. And it was, it was, um, it was uh, dominated by pagan worship. All these Greek gods were, were worshipped even in the Roman culture. And this was one of the more prominent Roman deities as they, they had embraced um, the, the roots of Greek mythology. And Ion was known for being the god of the ages, but he was more commonly, listen, listen to this, he was more commonly referred to as the father or the king of the universe or the God of gods or the Lord of lords or the Lord of all. Sound familiar? The, the symbolism is, is, is unbelievable. Some of you know about the zodiac. The zodiac represents the belt around the heavens and the earth. Don't get worried. I'm not going to start preaching astrology. There's a belt that goes around, and, and you know there's 12 signs of the zodiac, and, and Ion is standing in the middle of the 12 signs of the zodiac as if to say, I'm the center of the entire universe, the heavens and the earth. He's looking down and looking over Mother Earth and her four children, which represents the four seasons of life. This is like, I'm the God of all time, and this is my favorite. Look at this. This is, this is extraordinary. There's, I mean, if you think this is coincidence. I mean, that takes a lot of faith. Look, look, the, uh, there's two trees he's standing in between. The one that's, that's green, it's hard to tell in this, but if you look up the literature, you can see where it's described. This, this green tree that represents the tree of life and this barren tree over here that represents the tree of death. And he stands between two trees and claims to be the God of all time. And Jesus shows up in the scene. He uses this word and he claims to be the ultimate authority over all of time in this age, in this world, in this life, and in the one to come. Andy referred to this uh, on Easter, that the, the, the pagan gods were replaced in the, the Roman world. Uh, all of the Roman world, the Roman Empire, as Christianity was embraced as the national uh, religion of the Roman Empire. And Ion was one of the gods that was replaced by Jesus in the midst of this. And Jesus, he shows up, the centerpiece, the center message that has lasted for all of time. In fact, if this is your first time here and you're wondering, do we do Pictionary every week or do there are actual sermons? Like you're, you're, you may be wondering, and this is your first time here, you probably know this verse that's sort of the centerpiece of Jesus' message. It goes like this, for God so loved the world that in this age and in the age to come, but he, he loved the world that he created, the present earth and all the people in it. He loved the whole world 
Jesus speaking of himself, that he sent his one and only son. That whoever would believe, anyone who would believe in him, anyone who put their trust in him, would not be lost for all of time, would, would not die, but they would gain everlasting life or eternal life. He claimed to be able to give people eternal life. And this is why understanding, for those of you who are Christians specifically, what you've placed your faith in and how much trust and belief do you really have in that? Because here's why. Um, this is why coming to the best understanding about the realities of heaven is so important. And, and don't miss this because this is like setting up the whole series. I'm gonna come back to these truth claims, but, but your perspective, your perspective of heaven impacts how you live your life on earth. Not it can or it might. It has and it will impact how you live your life in this world and in a way bigger manner than you think it does, in a far more significant way than you think it does. And, and conversely, how you live on earth impacts how you'll experience heaven. This is what the Bible teaches. Now, these are both big claims, and I'm going to come back and I'm going to support these. The next two weeks, we're going to continue to build these out, and I'm going to show you what the Scriptures teaches about this, and then you, you can decide for yourself. I mean, you, you know, you make your own judgment whether you believe this or not. I'm just going to pull out the Scriptures, and we're going to look at them together. I'm going to do my best to give you my perspective based on the research I've done and reading a lot of other people, what I think, and then you can decide, but here's the truth. There is a principle that lies beneath this, these two claims right here that is at work in your life today, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not. And, and, and it's this, it's that we live toward what we look forward to in life. We live toward what we look forward to in life. Some, some of you are looking forward to getting married. And hopefully you're sort of getting your life together a little bit and you got a stable job and you're sort of trying to get out of debt and, and, and get yourself prepared to like spend eternity and not like bring your calamity on somebody else, but like actually be able to add value into a relationship. And maybe you've already done that and you found that person. And, and maybe like I had a couple in my office this week, I'm doing some premarital counseling and like they're preparing, they've done a lot of work to prepare for their life together. And they're preparing and they're looking forward to getting married. And it's impacted a lot of their behaviors along the way and a lot of the things that they're doing and how they're ordering their life. Some of you are really looking forward to trying to get this next promotion in life. And you're trying to get the, you're trying to climb the ladder and this next step is a big one for you. And so you're trying to be as diligent as you can and you're trying to take the most responsibility you possibly can at work and you're trying to be, become noticed and you're trying to, to, to uh, offer to help out in other ways, other ways you're not even paid for and help other people out and so that you can be in your best possible position that when it comes up for you to get this promotion and there's a lot that you're doing in order to get to that. And that's something you're looking forward to. And that's not a bad thing. It's just impacting the way you live your life now. And some of us, you know, we're looking forward to our next vacation. I'll just say, this is confession moment for me as a pastor. Like we get sucked into this all the time where it's like, you know, we have four kids and life is busy and there's a lot of mundane. And there's a lot of like hectic and we're going and we got something every night. And it's like, it's easy to like be on vacation. And at the end of the vacation go, I need something to look forward to. Let's plan our next vacation. Anybody with me? Thank you, at least one person. I got one person with me out of the whole crowd. Anyway, so, so like, you know, like you do that. And I'm not saying that's good. It's just like, it's something that you have to look forward to. So you live toward that thing. Some of you, you know, you're, you're in a place where you're looking forward to retirement. It's getting closer and closer and you've been preparing for a really long time. But now you're really trying to get your ducks in a row. And you're going like, how much more do I have to work? And how much more do I have to do to get to the place where I can, I can kind of really enjoy that season of my life the way I want to? Here's the point. The point is, is what you look forward to impacts and dictates how you're living now. It's just true. You can argue with me, but it's a reality in your life. And the more you look forward to something, the more you live in that direction the more your time and your effort and your energy and your behaviors are leveraged in that direction. Some of you, some of you have lived towards something for a really long time. And then maybe you got there, you achieved it. And you spent a bunch of time like investing in that. And when you arrived, you arrived only to figure out that what you sacrificed wasn't worth it. Listen to a speech of a valedictorian recently. 
And he talked about how at the end of his junior year, he found out that he was in the running to be the valedictorian. And he decided he was going to commit all of his pursuits to it. He did nothing fun over the summer. He studied. He was diligent. He sacrificed all his relationships. And he was diligent. He was, he was so determined and committed to win this award. And he won the award. And he said it felt amazing for 15 seconds. And on the 16th second, he said it dawned on him that it wasn't worth it. He regretted it. He regretted the fun he missed out on with his friends. He regretted economizing on those relationships. He missed out on so much more that this award couldn't give back to him. And it felt great for a few minutes. This is why the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Galatians, he said this. This is interesting. He says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ. Listen, listen, this is what you need to do. If you forget everything else, I feel like he would say this. If you forget everything else. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. This is where your ultimate hope is, on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. This is a place where God has, has created and it is creating something for you. Set your sights on, not on this world. In fact, he goes on, he says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Because if you think too much about the things of earth, I mean, it's, it's depressing, it's difficult. Like life is hard. And like we, we, we become normal, we, we normalize that. Where it's like, oh, no, life is good. And it's like, no, no, life's hard. It's challenging. Marriage is difficult. Parenting's hard. Work is hard. There's a reality that's been set before you. If you start setting your mind on it, it changes the way you feel about this life. So think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Live on earth in such a way that you set your mind, your mind and your heart are fixated on what is to come in the next life. Four, he goes on, he says, you died to this life. That's what you did when you decided to follow Jesus. You said, oh, there's something better beyond this life. And so I'm gonna die to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, he holds the keys to your real life, the new life, the everlasting life that he's promised you. When he's revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. See, this is sort of like the Stephen Covey thing, like think about the end of your life and what do you want to be known for? But it's like way bigger than that. It's like way beyond that. Don't just think to the end of your life. Think way beyond that to the eternity that's been promised to you with everlasting life, which means like an abundant amount of life, which, which is like, like the most amount of, an unlimited amount of life that's been promised to you. Look toward that because it'll change the way you live in this life, it's way different than Covey saw the end. He's saying, fix your mind on, on heaven, on heaven, because that's where you're destined for. I'll finish with a story. When I was uh, maybe seventh or eighth grade, my dad used to do these, um, he used to do these uh, devotionals with us in the morning. We'd sit around the breakfast table and um, they were called Keys for Kids. I don't even imagine there's many people here who've ever even heard of that, but there's these little devotionals for kids that when I was a kid, which is a long time ago, so I'm dating myself, but Keys for Kids was this thing where there would be a story. You'd read like an everyday story for kids and then there would be a Bible verse and then there's a key at the bottom. And like the game was we try to guess the key and I have a sister that's four years younger and a brother that's a year and a half older and we sit at the breakfast table and most days we'd endure my dad reading us the devotional. And, but sometimes like he would make it a game and like there's something to win. If you can guess the key, you know, you win something valuable. And uh, one day I remember, you know, I was thinking like, I don't know if I was thinking this at the time, but it was in a season where it was like, oh, this is really nice for my sister. I'm gonna check out, eat my breakfast, daydream while my dad's reading the story. And I wasn't really paying attention. And he got to the end and he pulled out a dollar. And I thought, phew, I didn't really need to listen today because a dollar is not much. He pulls out a dollar and he says, hey, what, what could you buy with a dollar? And I, he didn't, still didn't really have my attention. And then he said, what about $10? All right, what about $10? Because nobody was really playing. I was like, okay, $10? Now you got my attention a little bit. We talked about $10. And then he pulled $100 out of his pocket, $100 bill. He said, what would you do if you had $100? I was sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I, I should have been listening to the story. What was the story about? Like, <laughs> I was racking my brain, and I don't think I'd ever seen a $100 bill at that point in my life, truthfully. I, I don't, we didn't have a lot of money. I, I don't think I'd ever seen a $100 bill. 
And, and, and I was like, I mean, what do I do with $100? And we, we talked about it. And then he said, how about $1,000, $10,000 or $100,000? And I was like, can we go back to the $100? I want to learn, I wanna, how do I win the $100? And he's like, no, no, just, just listen to me for a minute. What would you do if you had a million dollars? Which was kind of fun. We talked about that. I remember thinking that we, I could buy a plane. Turns out you can't buy a plane for a million dollars. But I thought maybe I could buy a plane for a million dollars and or at least not the kind of plane you'd want to buy, um, or I wouldn't want to buy, I should say. Uh, then he says this, he said, he said, okay, what if we had a tree in the backyard that money grew on? What if you had an unlimited amount of money? What would you buy? We talked about that, and then he said, I remember, never forget this, my, never forgotten this in, gosh, I, I don't know, almost 40 years, not quite, 35 years. He said, if you had an unlimited amount of money, what would a hundred dollars be to you? I mean, you give that away, right? Like, not that big a deal. And he said, this is like life. We have an unlimited amount of life in Jesus. What's a hundred? What's a hundred when you got an unlimited amount? You give it away, wouldn't you? years later, my dad died. Turns out he only had 42. He had a lot less years than many of us do. Turns out um, you don't know how many years you have. I don't know how many years I have. And he didn't have as many as most of us do, but you know, I meet people all the time who tell me about the impact that Glenn Thomas had in their life because of the 42 years he spent on this earth. Come on. If you really believed, come on, what is belief? Is it just like words? Or is it like we, we believe because we act in such a way that this is true? If you really believed, if you acted in such a way that it was true, that you have eternal, everlasting, abundant more than you could ever imagine type of experience of life ahead of you, guaranteed for you on the other side of this life. How would that change the way you live this life? You should think about that. Here's the question I wanna leave you with today. What are you looking forward to in life most? Because the thing that you're looking forward to most, you're living toward the most. And you owe it to yourself to make sure it's something worthy of devoting your entire life to. Because make no mistake, it is dictating, it is determining how you live your life now, that thing that you're looking forward to the most. Make sure it's big enough. Make sure it's rewarding enough. Make sure it's something that you were designed to experience. If you ask me, I think it's heaven. I hope you'll join us in the next couple of weeks as we unpack all that's been promised to us. Let me pray for you. God, I pray today for somebody who came that this is a challenging idea to them. They're not sure what to think about heaven and they don't want to put too much stock in it. And they're worried about living their life as if they believe in that too much, what that means and what they would surrender and what they would give up. Because if that were really true, that would change a lot about the way they live. I, I just pray that you'd open their hearts and open their minds in the same way that we live toward and prepare toward all sorts of significant events, which there's nothing wrong with that, that are in our future. I pray that you would help us realize that how we view our perspective of heaven, that impacts how we live our lives here on earth. And, and also how we live our lives here on earth, that impacts how we'll experience and enjoy and the rewards we'll gain in heaven. I just pray for all of us that you would open our hearts. I pray for somebody today specifically that, that's, that's skeptical. I pray that um, you would move in them, that you would give them faith today, just maybe if it's just enough faith to be open to what the coming weeks hold in store. 
I pray that you would challenge all of us to think greater than just this life, that we would think in terms of this age and the age to come, and we wouldn't live for this age because it's temporary, but that we would live for the eternal, the way the Apostle Paul challenged us. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.